once upon a time. Of all the good days in the year. On Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house.
and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. So I say, God bless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
boat and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't want to make myself merry at Christmas and can't afford to make idle people merry. I support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough. Those who are badly off must go there. But many can't go there. And many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it. And decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to bestow their points, the gentlemen withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labours with an improved opinion of himself and in a more facetious temper than was usual with him. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his school and tacitly admitted the fact to the expected clerk in the tank who instantly snuffed out his candle and put his hat on. You'll want your day tomorrow. If I it's not convenient, sir. It's not convenient. And it's not fair. If I was to stop half the ground for it, you'd think yourself ill-used. I'll be bad. The clerk smiled faintly. And yet, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. The clerk observed that it was. Only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Said Scrooge, buttoning his great coat to the chin. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with the ground.
Matthew Cuthbert is surprised. Matthew Cuthbert enjoyed the pretty drive over to Bright River, <coughs> except the moments when he met women and had to nod to them. Matthew dreaded all women except his sister Marilla and their neighbour, Mrs. Rachel Lind. He had an uncomfortable feeling that the mysterious creatures were secretly laughing at him. When he reached Bright River, there was no sign of any train. The only living creature on the long platform was a girl waiting for something or somebody with all her might and main. That's the passenger truck after you, the station master said briskly. I'm not expecting a girl. It's a boy I'm here for. Guess there's some mistake. Mrs. Spencer came off the train with that girl. Said you and your sister were adopting her from an orphanage. I, I don't understand. Said Matthew helplessly, wishing that Marilla was at hand to cope with the situation. I suppose you're Mr. Matthew Cuthbert from Green Gables, said the girl in a peculiarly clear, sweet voice. I'm very glad to see you. I've made up my mind that if you weren't to come for me tonight, I'd go down the track to that big wild cherry tree up the bend and climb up into it to stay all night. It would be so lovely to sleep in a cherry tree, all white with bloom in the moonshine. Don't you think? Matthew could not tell this child with the glowing eyes that there had been a mistake. He would take her home and let Marilla do that. I'm, uh, I'm sorry I was late. Uh, come along and uh, give me your bag. Way of delight. Isn't that a nice imaginative name? 
moving forward as Matthew opens the door. Matthew Cuthbert? Who's that? Where's the boy? There wasn't any boy. No boy? There must have been a boy. We sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring a boy. Well, she didn't bring one. She brought her. Well, this is a pretty piece of business. You don't want me. You don't want me because I'm not a boy. I might have known this was all too beautiful to last. I might have known nobody ever did want me. Oh, what shall I do? I'm going to burst into tears. <laughs> well, there's no need to cry about it. Yes, there is need. You would cry too if you were an orphan and had come to a place that you thought was going to be home just to find out that they didn't want you because you weren't a boy. Never since she arrived at Green Gables. 
Marilla kept her clothed in plain dark dresses. All made out of the same unvarying pattern. Matthew realised that Anne's sleeves. Anne's sleeves. Anne's sleeves. Anne's sleeves did not look at all like the sleeves that the other girls wore. He recalled the cluster of little girls he had seen around her, all gay in waists of red and blue and pink and white. And he wondered why. Marilla always keeps us so plainly and soberly gown. I know best, and I am bringing her up. It will do no harm to let the child have one pretty dress. Matthew decided that he would give her a dress. Christmas was only a fortnight off. A nice new dress would be the very thing for a present. Matthew was a sign of satisfaction, put away his pipe. While Marilla opened all the doors and aired the house. Matthew betook himself to Carmody by the dress, determined to get the worst over and have done with it. Matthew felt he must be sure of a man behind the counter. So he went to Lawson's, where Samuel, or his son, would wait on him.
take uh, 20 pounds. When Matthew reached home, he hid the rake in the tool house. The sugar he took into Marilla. Brown sugar? Whatever possessed you to get so much? You know I never use it, except for the hard man's porridge or black fruit cake. Jerry's gone, and I've made my cake long ago. It's not good sugar either. It's coarse and dark. William Blair doesn't usually keep sugar like that. I, I thought it might come in handy sometime. When Matthew came to think the matter over, he decided that a woman was required to cope with the situation. Marilla was out of the question. To Miss Lynn, his friend and neighbor, he went accordingly. Pick out a dress for you to give to Anne. Well, to be sure, I will. I'm going to Carmody tomorrow and I'll attend to it. Have you something particular in mind? Mostly. No. Well, I... I'll just go by my own judgment then. I believe a nice bright apricot would just suit Anne. And William Lair has some new Gloria in that's real pretty. Perhaps you'd like me to make it up for her too. Seeing that if Marilla was to make it, Anne would probably catch wind a bit before the time and spoil the surprise. Uh, well, I'll do it. Uh, no, it isn't a night of trouble. I like sewing. I'll make it to fit my niece, Jenny Gillis, for her and Anne are like two peas as far as bigger goes. Well, well now, I'm much obliged, and I, and I don't know, but I think they make the sleeves uh, uh, different nowadays to what they used to be. If you wouldn't be asking too much, I, I'd like to make in the new way. <gasps> Next year, anyone who 
kitchen fire after Anne had gone to bed. Uh, well now, uh, I guess our Anne did as well as any of them. Yes, she did. She's a bright child, Matthew. And she looks real nice, too. I've been kind of opposed to this concert scheme. But I suppose there's no real harm in it after all. Anyhow, I was proud of that tonight. Although I'm not going to tell her so. Well now, I was proud of her. And I did tell her so before she went upstairs. Thought Lucy. 
stooping down to feel it with her hands. But instead of feeling the hard, smooth wood, like the floor of the wardrobe, she felt something soft and powdery and extremely cold. This is very queer, she said, and took a step or two further.
you with me. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. But I was wondering whether I ought to be getting back. Oh, it's only just down the corner. There'll be a roaring fire and toast and sardines and cake. Well, that's a very kind of you. But I shall be able to stay long. Oh, wonderful. If you would help me with my parcels, could you take the wings? Ah, oh, thank you. Doctor, if you, if you will take my arm, I shall be able to hold the umbrella over both of us. That's the way. No. Off we go. And so, Lucy found herself walking through the wood, arm in arm with this strange creature, as if they'd known one another all their lives. At the bottom of one small valley, Mr. Tumnus turned suddenly aside. Lucy found he was leading her into the entrance of a cave. As soon as they were inside, Lucy found herself blinking in the light of a wood fire. No, we shan't be long, said Mr. Thomas, and immediately would have kept him on. Lucy thought she had never been in a nicer place. It was a little, dry, clean cave of reddish stone with a carpet on the floor and two little chairs. One for me and one for a friend. And a table and a dresser and a mantelpiece over the fire. And above that, a picture of an old form with a great beard. Lucy looked at these while Mr. Tumnus was setting out her tea things. No, daughter of Eve. Really? It was. A wonderful tea. There was a nice brown egg, lightly boiled, for each of them. And then sardines on toast. And then buttered toast. And then toast with honey. And sugar topped cake. And when Lucy was tired of eating, the fawn began to talk. He had a wonderful tale to tell of life in the forest. About summer, when the woods were green and the whole forest jollification for weeks on end. Not that it isn't always winter now. He said gloomily. And then, to cheer himself up, he took out a strange little flute and began to play. And the tune he played made Lucy want to cry and laugh and dance. Whenever it got 
Lord, I don't suppose there ever was a worse one since the beginning of the world. What have you done? My old father now, that's his picture on the mantelpiece. He would never have done a thing like that.
of what I meant to do. Perhaps I may keep that handkerchief. Rather, said Lucy, and ran toward the far off patch of daylight. And presently, instead of rough branches brushing against her, she felt coats. And instead of crunching snow under her feet, she felt wooden balls. A moment later, she found herself jumping out of the wardrobe and into the same empty room from which the whole adventure started. I'm here! I'm here! It was still raining, and she could hear the voices of the others in the passage. I'm all right! I'm come back!
You should remember that you are a young lady. I'm not. And if turning up my hair makes me one, I'll wear it in two tails till I'm twenty. I hate to think I've got to grow up and be Miss Much and wear long gowns and look as prim as a china aster. It's bad enough I'm a girl anyway, and I like boys' games and work and manners. I can't get over my disappointment in not being a boy. And it's worse than ever now, for I'm dying to go and fight with Papa, that I can only stay home and knit like a poky old woman. Poor Joe, it's too bad. But you must be contented with making a new boyish and playing brother to us girls. As for you, Amy, you are altogether too particular and prim. Your airs are funny now. But you'll grow up an affected little goose if you don't take care. I like your nice manners and refined ways of speaking when you don't try to be elegant. But your absurd words are as bad as Joe's slang. If Joe is tomboy and Amy a goose, what am I to be? You're a dear and nothing else. These slippers are quite worn out. Marmy must have a new pair. I was going to get her some of my dollars. No! I shall! I'm the old I'm the man of the family now Hopper's away. So I shall provide the slippers. For he told me to take special care of Mother while he was gone. I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's each get her something for Christmas and not get anything for ourselves. That's like you, dear. What will we get? I shall get her a nice pair of gloves, army shoes, best to be had, some handkerchiefs, all heavy. I'll get her a little bottle of cologne. She likes it and won't cost much, so I'll have some left to buy my pencils. How will we get the things? Well, put them on the table and bring her in. Don't you remember how we used to on our birthdays? I used to be so frightened when it was my turn to sit in the chair with the crown on. And see you all come marching round to bring the presents for the kids. I like the things and the kisses, but it was dreadful to have you sit looking at me while I opened the bundles. Let Marmy think we're getting things for ourselves, and it surprised her. We ought to go shopping tomorrow afternoon, Meg. There's so much to do about the play for Christmas night. I don't mean to act anymore after this time. I'm getting too old for such things. You won't stop by now. As long as you can trail around in a white gown with your hair down, her gold paper jewelry. You're the best actress we've got, and there'll be an end to everything if you quit the boards. We ought to rehearse tonight. Come here, Amy, and practice the famous scene. For you're as stiff as a poker in that. I can't help it. I never saw anyone faint, and I don't choose to make myself all black and blue. Tumbling flat as you do. If I can go down easily, I'll drop. If I can't, I shall fall into a chair and be graceful. I don't care if Hugo does come at me with a pistol. Do it this way. Clasp your hands so and stagger across the room, crying frantically. Rodrigo!
He was too old to be drafted and not strong enough for a soldier. Don, I wish I could go as a drummer. A big, then, what's its name? Or a nurse, so I can be near him and help him. It must be very disagreeable to sleep in a tent and eat all sorts of bad tasting things and eat out of a tin mug. When will he come home, Marty? Not for many months, my dear, unless he is sick. He will stay and do his duty faithfully as long as he is able, and we won't ask for him back a minute sooner than he can be spared. Now come, and here's the letter. Give them all of my dear love and a kiss. Tell them I think of them by day, pray for them by night, and find my comfort in their affections at all times. A year seems very long to wait until I see them, but remind them that while we wait, we may have work, so that these hard days need not be wasted. I know they will remember all I said to them, that they will be loving children to you. Will do their duty faithfully. By their bosom and Bravely, and conquer themselves so beautifully, so that when I return to them, I may be fonder and prouder than ever of my little women. <laughs> Mother led them to the choir, for the mother was a 
Lord singer. For the first sound in the morning was her voice as she went about the house. 